Greetings. The Lord is with you. I'm Pastor Bob Quaintance from Good Hope Lutheran Church in Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, I'm getting on late tonight. You see, it's about 7.15, and I'm uh, I'm just getting on. I was uh, working on a project here at the office, and I should have just quit and, and got on, but I kept persevering through. And, well, in any event, I apologize for being late. Um, we are in Romans chapter 8 tonight, and I see a number of people are clicking on already. Uh, good evening, Shirley and Ray and others. We begin as we make the sign of the cross and say together, we are under the care of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in the middle here in Romans of just uh, three amazing uh, chapters. Uh, good evening, Fred. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with a word of prayer. And then recap quickly chapter six, well, chapters one through five, six, and seven, and look at today. There's so much in chapter eight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Romans and the truths embedded in this systematic theology of, of uh, St. Paul as he nails down the, the, um, the truths of the Christian faith. Lord, in such a way that they're not only things we need to know, but they're life transformative. Open our eyes and our hearts, our ears to your message and our lives to your spirit's transforming power. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining with me. Um, chapter one, Paul says in Romans, all Gentiles are sinners. And you can read the list of sins, and we're in there all over the place. Um, chapter 2 and into chapter 3, Paul says, all Jews are sinners. Uh, speaking as a Jew, Paul looked at everyone in the world as either a Jew or a Gentile. Uh, and and uh, Jews are no better off in terms of sin. They're better off in that they receive the promises, the covenants, the, uh, uh, the law, um, the prophets, the word, the salvation, but they kept sinning. Uh, so he ends in chapter 3, verse 23, saying all have sinned, and that then in chapter 3, verse 24, they are justified by his grace as a gift. They're made right with God by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Christ alone. Um, in chapter 4, so if we're saved by grace through faith, uh, he wants to talk about faith and, and, and nail that down for the Jewish hearers that Abraham was saved by faith. Um, he, was, uh, he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Chapter 4, uh, verse 3. Chapter 5, um, he talks about who it is that God saves, who it is that God justifies the weak, ungodly sinners and enemies, everyone just like Paul and just like us, who cannot save themselves, but God in great mercy and love saves us all. In that saving event, he takes us to chapter six. We are baptized, and in Christ's baptism, we are, can, we are buried with Christ in the waters of baptism so that we might, in baptism, rise with Christ as, rise, as he rose from the dead. We're connected in a mysterious way to his death on the cross and his resurrection on Easter morning um, so that our old sinful nature uh, that we are born with, our fallen human nature is nailed to the cross and dies and our new nature uh, comes to newness of life. Um, uh, Paul said in verse 7, uh, one who has died has been freed from sin. So we, in Christ, um, we are set free. Chapter 7 goes on to say, yeah, but we still live in this old body. And so the flesh, not really meaning the skin and bones and muscles, uh, but the old sinful nature in us is still here until we die. And, and so because of that, the good I want to do, I do not do, and the very evil I hate is what I end up doing. In, in baptism, chapter 6, I don't have to sin chapter 7, but because I'm in the flesh, we now have these two natures, as Luther said, saint and sinner at the same time. I am going to sin. And I'm going to, the good I want to do, I do not do, the very evil I hate, 
is what I end up doing. Paul ended up by saying in verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Well, he begins to give us the answer, which now in chapter 8, he's going to continue. Uh, the uh, last verse of twenty of uh, chapter 7. Thanks be to God. Who will deliver me, wretched man that I am? Well, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Remember Jesus said to the disciples uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray with me. The flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, with his spirit, with his mind, Paul serves the law of Christ. But uh, with, he, with his flesh, he's still stuck on serving the law of sin. So we are saved and, and forgiven and given a new, the spirit of God within us. We don't have to sin, chapter 7, but we do sin all the time. How are we to move forward in the life of sanctification? How do we, as I've said in the last couple of days, how do we, as Hebrews 10, verse 14 said, he has perfected, has perfected for all time, you are already perfect, has perfected on the cross for all time those who are being sanctified in the process of becoming perfect, becoming what God has created them to be. You are already perfect and in the process of becoming what he made you to be. That's sanctification. So how do we grow in this life of sanctification with this battle between the flesh and the spirit? Well, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. And verse chapter 8, uh, so we're into the body now. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. First thing to know, number one, you are forgiven. You're in this battle, and as we said at the end of yesterday, uh, there was a wonderful passage there. Um, I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin. There are days you will lose battles. You may lose battles for a week at a time, a month at a time. But we know you, you may, for years, you may lose battles. Not everyone, but plenty some repetitively, but we know the end of the story. Satan loses, sin is put to death, <laughs> and we are made alive. We will see Jesus as he is, and when we see him, we'll become like him. We'll become, well, perfect. What he has perf made us to be has perfected those who are being sanctified. So we'll, we'll lose battles, but in this battle, can we move forward a little bit? Oh, yes. Here's how it happens. But, but number one, remember, always you are forgiven. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ, not in your own flesh, but in Christ. In, in that I am connected to Christ, I am forgiven. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. The law could never make anyone perfect. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Somebody has to die. The penalty for sin is real. He sends Jesus to take on the penalty of our sins. In order he does that, he, he condemns sin by putting it on Jesus so that the re righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We're going to travel in this journey of life from what God has made us to be to becoming what he has made us to be. We will walk not according to our own ability. We have none. We are just weak, ungodly sinners and enemies of God. That's what we are. That's who we are. That's the flesh. 
who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, the, the new life of the spirit that is growing in you. For those who live according to the flesh, um, if you think you're going to just get better and need to try harder, uh, good evening, I, I see that Joyce is on, and, and uh, Mark, good evening to you as well. If you think you're going to get better just by trying harder, well, think again. It won't work. That's the flesh and the law. It won't do anything but lead you to sin, to weakness, to shame. Those who live according to the flesh, their own abilities, set their minds on the things of the flesh. This is what I have to do. Christians are often trapped into this thinking. They hear about, well, you just need to trust God more. Oh, this is what I need to do. I need to trust God more. And then if I'm not trusting God more, or bad things happen. I go, oh, I must be a failure not trusting God. Good grief. Are my eyes on Jesus when I talk like that? No, they're just on Bob. Bob's weakness or Bob's victory in this five minutes. <laughs> no, the, Bob won't save Bob or anybody else. Only Jesus will. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So, and in the battle with temptation or sin, in the battle with f flesh, we won't win it by trying harder, working harder. To set the mind on the flesh, what I have to do is death. It won't work. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Just rest in Jesus. You are in Christ. In baptism, in some mysterious way, Paul says in Romans 6, you were connected to Christ by his action. So rest where you are. Paul says in Colossians, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, right in his lap. Uh, remember who you belong to and that you are in Christ by God's action. Those who, set their, um, those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Look to Jesus. Remember Paul, Peter getting out of the boat to walk toward Jesus who said, come? Well, he started going pretty good when he kept his eyes on Jesus, but then he saw the storm, the wind and the waves, and he plopped right down. As soon as he took his eyes off Jesus and went down in the water, the flesh is of no value. You'll just sink. But it reminds us to look to Jesus, come to Jesus, set our mind on the things of the Spirit. Then we find life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. <laughs> no, doing it my way. The very I, the letter S-I-N, is epitomized by pride and, and, and doing things my way. No, but I've, I just look to Jesus. The mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law, which is the law of the Spirit, not the Ten Commandments. Indeed, the flesh cannot submit to God. It is broken in bondage to sin. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In this battle with sin, trying harder is not going to help, and trying harder won't please God. However, remember this. You are not in the flesh. You may be in this life in the flesh, but that's not your true identity. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the Son of God dwells in you, which he does by faith and baptism, by his grace, he comes to live in us. Anyone who does not have the spirit of, God, of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If Christ is in you, if you believe in Christ, if you believe and are baptized, Christ is in you. And, and because he is in you, there's a new reality. Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. There's a part of you that's dead. You don't have to focus on that old sinful part. 
There's a part of you that is alive in Christ. And nothing can take that away. We'll hear about that at the end of the chapter. Boy, we got a ways to go. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. God rose Jesus, raised Jesus from the dead. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And he will just as much give life to your mortal body. He will do it. It's a promise. And God is pretty good about speaking and promising and always fulfilling his promises. So then, brothers, he says, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We don't owe anything to our old sinful nature. We don't have to do what it tells us to do. It's not our master anymore. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If by God's help you don't live at the whim of the flesh, leading you to do everything it calls you to do. Well, then you will live. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. For you will not receive the Spirit, you, you did not receive the Spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the Spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You are a child of God, and you yearn and long for him. That means the Spirit is in you, and he will make his promise come true. Relax. Remember, you are forgiven. And he invites you to not listen to the, to the flesh, but to listen to him. But, but listen to this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also, also be glorified with him. This is a battle, and there will be suffering. Paul knows that. We know the final victory will come. Paul knows that, and so do you. But he talks about the suffering and that you are not alone in this suffering. He tells us in a surprising way who joins us in suffering. For I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed for us. For the creation, the water, the air, the trees, everything, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. The trees and and the the um, the trees and the and the air and the water didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> Adam and Eve did, but the creation fell. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Every human being, every animal, every tree and bit of water or air, it has all been suffering. And sometimes as humans, we cause greater suffering. The whole creation has been longing, groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly. That's because people who are trapped by sin, they have a hardened heart and they don't know that eating, drinking, and being married isn't the best part of life. And they go into drugs and sex and alcohol and, and think that somehow they're, they're going to have a better life. But it leads to death. Spiritually and physically. We join in creation, groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. We groan until that day when we're fully brought home to heaven. 
the rede- we, waiting for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So for in this hope that the day is coming when the battles will be over and the war will be won, in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not yet see, we wait for it with patience. Number one, you are forgiven. Number two, don't don't follow the, the flesh. Follow the spirit. Point three, be patient. Isn't that a great thing? Be patient. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Um, We're first, we know that number one, we're forgiven. Number two, we're to walk by the Spirit, not, not the flesh. Number three, be patient. God's not done with you yet. And he's not done with your neighbor either. Number four, pray. We do not know what to pray for. Uh, the, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. God's Spirit living within you. <laughs> He's praying for you. With your times of groaning and sighing, wondering, when wretched man that I am, the Spirit in those groanings is praying to God according to the will of God. He's groaning with, with, words too deep, with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches your heart and all the hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, here, wonderful verse 28, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. There's lots of suffering. It isn't good. But God is at work to bring us through that suffering and produce some good. It's terrible if suffering is just wasted and becomes repetitive. I think we see that about the school shootings. Can't we make some progress to harden school buildings, to lock doors? Can't we make some progress to keep people who shouldn't be having guns um, that, that have large magazines. Uh, can't we have some progress? Can't the NRA, which wants to protect the rights of gun owners, can't it also lead the champion the way to make people safer? <laughs> That'd be a good thing. That would make them not defending a, uh, what, what is their right, but helping to solve a societal problem. Boy, that'd be wonderful. God, let that happen. He who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. And God works all things together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son. He knows what you're going to look like. He has perfected you, and you will be like Christ. That's the end goal, conformed into his image. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Past tense. It's been done. You have been perfected. You have been, uh, he knew you. He predestined you, designed you, um, uh, and called you and forgave you, made you right with him, and has glorified you. This is back to that baptismal language in chapter 6. So three great questions. And um, it brings us to the end of of chapter 8. Three great questions. Number one, if God is for us, who is against us? God is on our side in the midst of the battle, in the war that is waging. Battles in this war we will lose many times. But we have this hope. We are forgiven. We're called, given the instruction to not try harder with your flesh, but to look to Jesus. Uh, we're given the, the word of encouragement to be patient. 
and know that God is praying for you while you pray about it. Uh, he is confident that he will make you become like Jesus. <laughs> I'm confident that he who began, Paul said this, and Bob Quainton says this, Paul, uh, Paul and Bob is con are confident that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So these three questions, if God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> if God is on your side, well, there's, there's the winning group. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You will lack nothing. Seek first his kingdom and all these things will be given to you. You will lack nothing. He, does, he hasn't withheld Jesus. He will not withhold anything from you. Second question. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? You know, the people like Paul, wretched man that I am, uh, your neighbor who uh, drives you nuts, yourself who drives you nuts. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Hmm, a lot of people. Huh? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It's not Jesus. It's not God. It's only the sin, death, and the devil that condemns. It is not God. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. <laughs> Along with the Spirit praying for you, now you have Jesus at the right hand of God praying for you in this war and battle that you are in. Let's join God in prayer the Spirit in Jesus, praying for our country, praying in the midst of the violence in our community here in Youngstown, um, working and challenging people to not just protect themselves, but to make a difference in moving us forward toward a, 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 a more safety. And ultimately, as Christians, we know that will come when people turn to God and have faith in him. But even without that, we're called to help others, in, in our neighbor in need. And our neighbor in need is our neighbor in violent times, frightening times for parents to send their children to school. Well, who will bring a charge against you? Nobody. Jesus forgives. And third question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, there's a big long list. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, the sword. Can anything uh, separate you from Christ? He goes on to say, quoting Psalm 44, it feels like for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. What a horrible image. No, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. We know we'll win. We conquer through him who loved us, the Father sending his Son, and Jesus dying for us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is faithful. He's on your side. There's no one to condemn. You are already forgiven. And no one can snatch you out of his hand. No one can separate you from God's love. It is the for sure thing. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you um, for this three chapters so deeply profound. Lord, each of us are in struggles. Our country, our communities, our, our, our world is full of struggle and suffering and pain and sin. In our own lives, Lord, we battle. Lord, grant us your spirit. Uh, grant us a fresh awareness of your love your commitment to us, your forgiveness, 
your presence in our lives so that, Lord, we might not try harder, but turn to you for your help, your forgiveness. Grant us patience with our neighbor, our family members, our fellow church members, ourselves. Help us to experience and share your love in our community of faith, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in this world. Lord, thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. You've made wonderful promises today, Lord. We know you are faithful. Grant to us, Lord, your spirit in this journey. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with me tonight. We go into the next section of, of um, uh, and tomorrow is what, Friday? Uh, it's a three-chapter section, 9, 10, and 11, where we actually talk about the faithfulness of God. And uh, if God is faithful, is he really? So we'll be looking at that question of the faithfulness of God in chapters 9, 10, and 11, so that then we finish the first section, main section of, of Romans, where it talks about how we're saved by grace through faith and how he gives us the spirit and we have a new identity. And then we're going to look at the life application part. Well, so what does this mean for our life? Chapters 12 through 16. But we're into this next section beginning tomorrow, chapter 9. It's Friday. Um, I'm still here at the office. I don't know when I'm going to get away, but I'm not leaving until I'm done and uh, with what I need to do tonight. And uh, uh, then I'll be with you sometime tomorrow and uh, looking at chapter 9, and then we'll move on next week. Remember always, God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.